All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode 43. And this is the last episode of 2018. As you might imagine, it's been, uh, you know, holidays, Christmas, whatever the hell you celebrate, and there's not that many things happening. So we got a tiny bit of articles, news, and some other things that I will cover over here. Majority of other outlets just go around and say, hey, we're gonna show you the best things of the year. I'm too lazy for that, so I'm actually gonna do the proper thing, which is, you know, there's not that much things to talk about, but we're gonna do that anyway. Uh, hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. Yes, indeed, the Twitch introduced this new VIP stuff and I gave it away to you guys who supported me for ages, basically. So, uh, yeah, um, you know what, let's get started. <laughs> We don't really have that much uh, and I just want to go through that and go have um, some more rest, I guess. It's been too much socializing in the, in the weekends and in the holidays, but <laughs> there we go. First article we got here is called Let's Build a Real-Time WebGL Map of All Airplanes. And it's exactly what it says. It's a pretty interesting tutorial. I mean, it's very basic, but it's really cool on how to build a WebGL map of all the planes that fly around in real time, which is a really neat uh, demo. And I think it's, you know, one that is quite impressive. There is, of course, an API for that. So you wouldn't really have to do anything yourself. Uh, and you would also use the D3.js for rendering, which, as you might imagine, can do just about everything. Um, so yeah, if you were ever interested in trying out something like this, do check it out. It is pretty cool and will get you a really nice visualization of all the planes around the world. Next article we got here is Node.js Fundamentals, web server without dependencies. And just as it says, it talks about using just a node core or standard lib HTTP package to build a server, right? Which uh, I think we already had similar articles before here, but this one is actually quite extensive and it talks about just everything you might want to have on the server, including body parsing, HTTP methods, routing, and so on and so forth. Um, I think the interesting discussion around that article came up on the Twitter as the people who like, you know, some of them maintain uh, similar packages, the other were just uh, pretty um, prominent developers in node community, they started a discussion that essentially, the problem with using the core package is not about the complexity of related, you know, listing and everything, because this is quite straightforward but actually around uh, matching the routes, right? So this is the trickiest bit because you have to parse the URL and then somehow match it to whatever the hell is the function that should be called, right? And the uh, one of the ideas was that once the um, Node.js actually gets the pattern matching, which is coming quite soon, right? Um, building servers just using Node Core will be like 20 times easier and more efficient than using something like Express. So, you know, in, in near future, once we get the pattern matching in V8, uh, you might no longer need Express and other frameworks for a very basic apps, which is kind of cool. So it's, you know, a good point to start learning the HTTP lib. And if you want to do this, this article is quite good. So do check it out. Next article we got here is building a to-do list with React hooks reducer, use reducer, sorry. So um, yeah, hooks are still not out, uh, coming out soon-ish, I'm thinking in the next couple of weeks, right? Because they were teasing them again in a previous release. And use reducer is one of the hooks that essentially mimics the um, Redux API, right? So you get the reducers there. And this is sort of a more advanced tutorial that guides you through building to-do app just using that hook essentially, right? Which, I mean, it's a very powerful uh, way of doing it. And it essentially allows you to do pretty much what you would have with a Redux app. So if you're still confused by that hook, if you're still uh, curious on how you can do the, use it to build a basic to-do app, this is a very good article, pretty thorough, and will get you started in no time. Do check it out. Next article we got here is why I left React for Vue. Um, Big red warning, it's very opinionated. Some of the things that the author talks about, I completely disagree with, but it is an interesting perspective nonetheless. So if you were considering, um, or I, I'd say if you were thinking that React might be too complicated for you, that you are not always kind of okay with the functional programming oriented ways of doing things, and this is sort of the way that React been developing for the past, and I personally love it, 
um, then you might have a look at this article because it gives some uh, points that are basically where view wins. Um, it does fails to mention that, uh, for example, there's the performance comparison, right? That talks about this, the synthetic benchmark that I think is used just about everywhere with like, you know, creating rows, swapping rows, whatever. And uh, it's been, I think it's the React team has already discussed this. I don't remember how many times. There's been like 20 talks on that or something that the React is never optimized for synthetic benchmarks because they don't really have to, right? So they have a Facebook that is a real website used by millions of people and they optimize it for the use cases of the Facebook, which is the real website, which might be why in synthetic use cases, it might not perform as well as something like Vue, for example, or to be frank, anything else that is built specifically around these use cases, right? So I don't think that looking at only one benchmark, one synthetic benchmark is the way to go when measuring performance, but well, that's one of the points of the article. Um, nonetheless, if you are using React and you don't feel like it's your cup of tea, do check out this article. It has some uh, interesting points, interesting comparisons. Don't take them for granted. That is not exactly, you know, 100%. None of them are 100% correct. They are all opinionated, okay? So just, just take it with a grain of salt, basically. But it's quite good nonetheless. All right. Next article we got here is arc second parsing in JavaScript made easy. This is about um, an article essentially about building your own grammar, right? So sometimes you can go by by just using uh, regex, but other times you get a very complicated uh, structure that is very hard to parse with a regex and you might be better off with writing your own proper parser with a proper grammar, right? And this is exactly what this arc seconds uh, is. It's a parser combinator library that basically allows you to build complex parsers in a pretty simple way. And actually it's a really, really nice and code driven way, right? Because at least the majority of parsers, uh, libraries to build parsers that I've worked with usually have their own syntax or use that. I don't even remember how it's called to be honest because it's not exactly my field, but I had to build like a couple of parsers and there's this common syntax that is typically used. This one just uses functions, which is kind of awesome. And I mean, at least it looks really good. So haven't tried it yet, but looks very interesting. So if you were curious on how you could actually build your own parser in JavaScript, in this case, there's two examples. First one is uh, CSV. Second one is JSON. And then you go to build the JavaScript parser and all of this in this tiny article that is like 10 pages maybe which is quite nice. So if you were interested in the topic, do check it out. This seems to be quite damn good. All right, next article we got here is the absolute essentials for bit manipulation in JavaScript. Once again, the bit bits operation topic, bitwise operations and all that kind of stuff pops up. As I already said many times, hell if I remember anything when working with this, every time I had to Google for that. And uh, this is another article that basically sums up everything you have to know about bitwise operations very nicely. So if you are curious about that, or if you need a reference, I would think actually I would save that and use it as a reference. Do check it out because it literally has everything you need to know about the bitwise operations in JavaScript, including pretty good examples. So if you were curious, or if you needed a good reference, uh, check this article out, it probably has everything you want to know. Next article we've got here is how to create a Node.js web app using no external packages. Uh, once again, Another example on how to use the HTTP core module to build the basic HTTP server. Uh, slightly shorter, I would say, and less, you know, going less in depth, but does give you a very good overview of what exactly you have to do here. So if the previous article did not, um, wasn't clear enough for you, check this one out as well. Maybe this will clarify a couple of things, but uh, yeah, it's basically more or less the same, um, but there you go. All right, uh, last thing we got here in the news and articles today is the new course, uh, free course on Scrimba called Neural Networks in JavaScript. It's a 19 part course that will teach you how to build your own neural networks in JavaScript. And it is from the author of Brain.js, which is a pretty good um, neural network library for JavaScript. So if you were ever curious of how you can actually build a basic neural network in JavaScript, 
then check it out. It's quite cool. And the Screamer platform is also quite nice because it literally allows you to pause the video at any point and start editing the code and executing it right in your browser, which is kind of awesome. So check it out. All right, this is it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tiny awesome things that I've found that are not quite news, but still quite good. And I want to highlight them. So let us start with this uh, first tweet from uh, Mr. Jeff Atwood. The reminder that 10 years ago, Chrome had 0% market share and essentially, you know, didn't quite exist. And today it is literally the largest browser. So it actually escalated very quickly. So I'll be curious to see if we will get a new browser soon that would actually defeat the Chrome or if the Chrome is now, you know, will be around forever, which is not actually likely. <laughs> Okay, very curious to see where the whole um, internet sphere will go in next 10 years. Right, next thing we got here is this uh, new, I, don't, I wouldn't call it hype train or trend, but uh, people started setting up this NPX username um, cards essentially, right, with your data. I think it's it started with a, a bit in bank uh, who is uh, Siren, yes, exactly. And uh, then one of the, I think the next one I saw was the CEO of the NPM. I forgot his name, but yeah. So the people just started cloning this repo and, and setting up their own cars because it just looks nice. And, you know, literally just say, hey, run NPX, my username, and you got it. And I probably want to set this up as well because it's literally just a nicely formatted thing. But I've been too lazy to fork the repo and do it myself. So if that looks cool and if you think that might be useful for you as a JavaScript developer, do check it out. The guide is pretty nice and uh, maybe you will be, uh, you know, you get a nice card that you can just tell people, hey, run npx my username and you will get all the info you want. Um, so yeah, obviously extendable to whatever the hell you want, not just like Twitter, GitHub, whatever, you know, it's, it's just a ASCII yard essentially. But yeah, pretty cool. Next thing we got here is the mini function of the day called next events. Uh, it's a function that gives you a promise to next event of certain type. Really cool to use with a sync of eight. The function itself is super straightforward. You just give it a target and a event name. And it basically returns a promise that adds an event listener that resolves once when that event is triggered, right? Which is very easy, but it's actually really cool. You can evade user interactions and stuff like this in your asynchronous functions. So pretty neat. I really like it. Next tiny thing we got here is a dev tool tip. Uh, you can use dollar underscore in uh, Chrome console to get the last value of the last expression evaluated, which is actually something as the people in the comments found out that is not shown in the current uh, auto suggestion, right? So you actually get the dollar, 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 dollar X as the suggestions, but you don't get the dollar underscore, which nonetheless is um, actually there. So if you get like dollar underscore, well actually, okay, in this case it's undefined, but if we go A and then dollar, dollar underscore, you'll get the same value A, but it's not auto suggested. So even if you don't see it there, it is there, just there's some weird bug in the dev tools. And the next thing we got here is the things I don't know as of 2018 from uh, Dan Abramov on his blog overreacted. And I thought it was just a really good reminder that there is a lot of people, a lot of areas, and you can never know everything, right? So all of us have their own specializations and all of us don't know a ton of things about, well, pretty much everything else that we don't really do, right? So it's a good reminder. And there's a list of basically things that Dan doesn't know, which I mean, basically some of them overlap with the things I know. The others is where very much close strikes close to home for me. For example, the modern CSS. Nope, that is like I <laughs> for the life of me, I cannot properly do any CSS. So, you know. But yeah, um, just a good reminder that, you know, all people are people and cannot really know everything. So there you go, just keep trying and you will eventually get there. Um, and the last thing we got here is this bit from Mike Acton, uh, who is a quite well known, I think, uh, game developer, who worked on the game engines for quite a lot, I think like more than 20 years already now. But yeah, it essentially talks about the um, don't repeat yourself rule, right? So there was another holy war about dry and the point here is that dry is actually not that bad. Uh, creating wrong extra abstractions is actually worse than repeating ourselves, And a lot of people agree with that. So there's a nice summary of that. The rule of three, 
Never create abstraction layers before you have three working independently coded cases. Then it's not an abstraction, it's, it's extracted commonality, which is a great way of putting it. And uh, the way I picked up this tweet, I actually don't follow Mike, would probably I should, because it sounds like he's got some interesting thoughts, but I actually saw this tweet retweeted by Oh, John Carmack, uh, who is also, you know, a very good developer and probably a person you should listen to. So don't listen to me, listen to Mr. Mike Acton and John Carmack because they uh, know their stuff. All right, uh, now we get to the releases section. We're basically <laughs> going through this really fast because there's not much things happening. As I said, you know, Christmas, New Year and all that kind of stuff. Right, so releases, we got four of them today. First one being a really major one, actually. Rollup has finally reached version 1.0 and was released right after Christmas, essentially. They've got a ton of things going on there. So if you've been using it, make sure to check out the breaking changes. If you have not been using it, make sure to check it out because Rollup is a fantastic bundler for libraries and tiny things, you know, components and things that you publish on NPM. For use, it is working way better, uh, in my opinion, than the pack or parcel or anything else for the components specifically. Um, haven't really tried using it for the apps. Not sure I have to check that out. But yeah, for the tiny libraries and components, it's a fantastic bundler and you should check it out now that it's version 1.0. Even so, it's been working quite well even before. <laughs> Next release we got here is WebDriver IO version 5. It's a pretty major release uh, for the WebDriver. If you've been using it, make sure to check again the um, breaking changes and how to upgrade section. There is quite a lot of them and it seems like they've added quite a bunch of split the stuff into separate packages. So you have like less dependencies and can reuse the stuff like, you know, they also now use the NPM um, namespace for publishing their packages like the mocha framework spec reporter and all that kind of stuff but yeah uh, seems to be pretty nice moving to the modern world basically web driver is a very big very heavy package but sometimes quite necessary so do check it out we also got two node.js releases node.js version 11.6 that adds the max header size flag as well as a bunch of other things and upgrades the npm to 6.5 and libuv to 124.1 um, everything else is basically minor things. Uh, the same goes for the Node 1015 LTS upgrade, which adds this same HTTP header flag size and fixes a regression and HTTP binary. So if you're on LTS, make sure to upgrade. And that's basically it for releases. Now we are in the packages uh, section. The first package we got here is Layout Architect. A small utility for building layouts written in vanilla JS, and it essentially allows you to uh, customize layouts like this. I like it. it produces the JSON of the layouts that you can later use for whatever your app is needs to be used. Right? Seems slick enough. So maybe you were looking for something like this. Do check it out. Seems quite nice. Next thing we got here is Viv JS. I have no idea why would you use that, but it's a library for a more Wiggly divs. It, it's yeah, it's Wiggly divs. So Viv, you know, it's it's terrible. And please don't use this on your website. But there you go. It's just all Wiggly and and terrible. Yes. <laughs> Next thing we got here is a React Kawaii cute React SVG components that uh, literally allows you to do things like this. And there's like you have mood, you have color, you have size, you have animations, and there's like different components that all look very cute and have faces and animated and everything. And it's just great. Why would you not use that on your website? <laughs> there you go. Next thing we got here is Music Funds, a JavaScript music utility library that contains small music notation related functions. So if you ever needed to work with music notation, do check it out. It seems to have quite a lot of actually functions. So it's like Lodash for music notation at this point, essentially. Seems quite nice. Check it out if you're working with music. Next thing we got here is a CLSX a tiny 200 byte utility for constructing class name strings for React, Preact or whatever conditionally. And it's supposed to be a drop in replacement for class names module that is uh, slightly bigger and actually slower according to the benchmarks. Uh, from Mr. Luke Edwards, if you remember him, he is the guy behind uh, Polka, for example, and a bunch of other super tiny, super fast libraries. So it's probably really good. And if you're using class names, consider replacing it with this one. So, yeah, seems pretty straightforward actually. Also supports Veratic 
you know, ways of uh, defining classes, uh, even with arrays, which is kind of insane. So yeah, quite nice. All right, next thing we got here is typed GraphQlify, a TypeScript to GraphQL conversion tool without losing type information. So it uh, aims to give a better TypeScript and GraphQL experience. I, as a person who never uses TypeScript, uh, wouldn't say, I mean, I used it once or twice, but I'm not using it daily, basically. I don't really know how it compares to just using TypeScript with GraphQL. I guess having more types is always better in TypeScript, right? So if you're working with GraphQL and TypeScript, do check it out. Maybe this will save you some time or make your GraphQL experience better. Next library we got here is ODI or OD. I'm not sure uh, how exactly you read that. Opinionated declarative idiomatic framework for building scalable supportive enterprise applications and service. This is a web framework inspired by ASP.NET and Spring. So you know exactly what you are gonna get. It is a very MVC based, like MVC based, no, that's not correct. It's basically MVC framework, right? And it's very object oriented and has the decorators classes and all the kind of things that you would get in .NET or Spring or Java or whatever. As you might know, I'm not a big fan of that, but maybe you are, then do check it out. It looks quite well thought through. So maybe this is what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is Domi Cli, a package manager for components. So people seem to still uh, not be happy exactly with the uh, NPM uh, and uh, try to figure out the way to package web components using NPM in a better way. And this is exactly what the DOMI does. So it does use NPM registry in the background, but sort of allows you to work with um, web components in a better way, I guess. I'm not exactly sure how it works. It is still in alpha and there's not that many documentation explaining what the hell is going on and why should I use that over NPM. But uh, maybe, you know, you know the pains of web components and you know the pains of using NPM with web components and um, maybe you are looking for something like this. All right. Next thing we got here is Notable, the markdown based note taking app that doesn't suck. Uh, very sleek looking markdown taking um, note taking app essentially with a bunch of uh, features like synchronizations and backups and everything, you know, so this looks, looks very nice actually. So you are using something like this and was looking for a self hosted version, do check it out. It seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got here is pick a day, a refreshing JavaScript date picker, lightweight, no dependencies and modular CSS that you can style yourself. Five kilobytes minified and gzipped, doesn't use any moment.js or anything like this, but plays well with pretty much any libraries out there and uh, modular CSS for easy styling. Looks very nice. So if you are looking for a date picker, check it out. Maybe this is what you want. Next thing we got here is skill set plots, a UI component that helps to represent skills in a visually appealing way. This is how it looks, it's essentially X and Y axis. Um, I guess you can define whatever you want on those axes because by default it's like knowledge and love, which <laughs> I guess it works, you know? So maybe you wanted to add something like this to your website, so ch check it out. And uh, the next thing we got here is the try F sharp in browser. So um, the F sharp team created a WebAssembly F sharp compiler that you can run directly in your browser. So you can actually try F sharp in your browser and uh, see how the language works. For example, here is a Fibonacci F sharp function that runs directly in my browser and compiled directly in my browser, which is kind of insane. So if you ever wanted to give F sharp a try. Now you can in your own uh, nice framework. It even seems to be working with the uh, HTTP request, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Okay, that is, oh no, it actually compiles it. Okay, <laughs> that makes more sense, but it's still pretty cool. Just check it out. And the last demo we have here is the Crossy Rose with 3JS, which is a code pen demo, which is um, essentially a frogger, right? So you can you can play it. It's it's a uh, no, I, I died, but it actually allows you to move further. But it's it's actually really cool. And if you are ever curious on how to build games using 3JS, then check this one out. It is very nice and uh, looks like endless, basically. There you go. All right, that's it for the demos and uh, libraries. Now we are into the last silliness and other bonkers section. 
and the interesting stuff essentially. First one I want to highlight today is the gift of giving up. It is an article from the Google developers team. Um, the guys who worked on Google Santa Tracker that actually was not updated this year and was not published this year. And there's a story why, because uh, it was a Polymer app and they needed to update it. And there's like tons of problems with that. And um, this is exactly the story of why they decided to postpone the update to after holidays to not stress it and why it's great to give up and postpone stuff from time to time. So do give it a red. It's really cool. Next thing we got here is the really cool guide um, to sort of a great gift that you can give to your families by making their computer run like new again. There's a guide that will help you to do this with a Windows 10 machine, which is something I still um, didn't get my hands on, but I really want to do as well to my machine. Not that it's running, you know, slower than before, but cleaning stuff up in Windows is never a bad idea. So do check it out. Yes, this is, um, this is probably my favorite article of the week. It's called Doomba turns your robotic vacuum cleaner into a doom map making machine. Now I think I need a robot vacuum just, <laughs> just to do this. So you can, you can use this software to uh, use your Roomba to create a doom level out of your flat and then literally play it. So I think, I, I think I need that in my life. Just, you know, just to be able to run around my house and kill demons. That sounds... <laughs> Sounds like a great time. Um, and to wrap the stream up, there's this uh, Pikachu joke with a professor doesn't give enough time to add CSS to my website. And then there's a very broken Pikachu with all the eyes and mouth and everything aligned to the left side, which is yeah, basically what you would get if you don't have CSS. Which in my opinion is hilarious and very stupid. And if you're listening to this podcast, just take a look at the link. It's way better than my explanation of it, essentially. Really good. All right. That's basically it from my side. This was episode 43 of BXS Weekly. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub in the description, wherever you're listening or watching this. Um, thank you guys for your continued support. This was hell of a year. It's like, yeah, more than 40 episodes in a year, which is kind of insane. Um, considering we just started this thing, you know, so yeah. Um, once again, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, whatever you're celebrating, happy new year. Yes. Happy new year. Uh, pretty much we are, I mean, we're going to have the next episode in the new year already. Right. So, um, in, in a week, it's going to be January 5th already. Um, I am going to have a holiday, like a new year stream, probably on 1st of January. Once I already said I have a birthday on 1st of January. So we're going to have some birthday streaming. We're going to have some giveaways and uh, probably it's just going to be silly gaming and, you know, chatting with, with you guys, nothing uh, development related. And uh, yeah, so yes, hopefully the next year will be awesome. I, I, I know it will be awesome. So there you go. This is, this was BXS Weekly. Thank you so much for your support, guys. Thank you for watching. Have an amazing uh, rest days of the year and have an awesome new year. And I see you next year. Bye.